Let's go ahead and start. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this opportunity that we have to come together and read from your word together as family, that we can uh, learn things, that we can share back and forth with each other, that we'll be able to incorporate these things into our lives that as we read about the story, we're now in the place where Paul is going to be arrested and we just ask that as we examine and look at his life that it will bring us courage and hope as we see how relaxed and how confident he is because you promised that you would keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you and so father we trust in you to this end we thank you in Jesus name amen, amen. So let's uh, let's do like we did last time, though, where we'll have uh, one person read a whole page. There'll be three of us, so we'll we'll alternate. Okay, I'll start with the first page, and then uh, somebody else will take up the second page. Brethren and fathers, oh, let me do a little background here. Let's see. Let me go back a little bit, because uh, as David mentioned last time, sometimes the way they divide the. Uh, the passages is kind of low. so we'll pick it up back in uh, verse 40. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs. And what stairs is that? Remember, they, 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 uh, they remember from last time, they were, they were determined to kill this guy. And so he sent, so saw, saw all the commotion, he sent soldiers and they, they had to literally pick Paul up and carry him through the crowd of, of irate people. And they get up into the stairs and they let him down and they, they get up on the stairs and uh, Paul asked permission to uh, speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, that's interesting. He waves his hand and just that gesture I mean, obviously, God is even working through him, even in a gesture, that these people are so outraged and they are so, I mean, they're just having fits. And yet, when he raises his hand, they all call him down. And they, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. And so he says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And that defense is the word, let me look at my notes here. Apologia, from which we get the word apologetics. And so this is the first of, uh, well, this is one of several speeches, not the first, but the ones that we're going to be looking through after this, you'll see the list of them here. It's like one, two, three, four, five more speeches. In total, Paul gives like 11 sermons in Acts. Of course, he gave a lot more, but those are the ones that are recorded for us. So his defense, his apologia, which is always being ready to give an answer for the face that is in you. Verse two, and when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of the, our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons, both men and women, as also the high priest bears witness and all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. 
And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a, a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue, I imprison and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until this word, and then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commander answered, with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. Then immediately, those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Okay, so <laughs> kind of scared them. They re realized that, uh-oh. Uh, Roman citizens really had uh, quite the rights. In fact, they were not supposed to be scourged. They weren't even supposed to be bound. So, and, and, and if they were deserving of death, Roman citizens were to be beheaded because they considered that much more merciful and quick rather than crucifixion. You never, Romans, it was so despised. The cross was so despised and hated that you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't dare put a Roman on the cross. So let's, uh, I'm gonna go back to uh, the very beginning here and look at some things. Let's see. Um, there's some more, there are details. That, what I find interesting is every time Paul relates his story, you get little different snippets and different details. So I'd kind of like to uh, look at some other details here um, on Acts 26, um, let's go to that, let me see. So right here it says, we just heard, uh, now this is in addition to Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So that's a little bit more detail there. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and those things in, 
and those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So that gives us a little bit more details of uh, what he was actually hearing there in that, in that encounter with uh, Jesus. Well, I thought that was pretty interesting there. Anybody else have any comments? This one was uh, pretty straightforward and uh, just kind of no, no theology per se here. Nothing really deep. He's just basically relating uh, his experience on the road because that was always gave people the confidence that, uh, look, this thing was definitely a, as of God. It definitely made a radical transformation in his life. Now, there's certain, let me see my note here I have on Ananias. Uh, there's a little bit more detailed account of Ananias. We looked at that last time. Do you remember what uh, Ananias, Ananias's reaction was when uh, Jesus <laughs> told him that, uh, hey, there's a man who's <laughs> in a house at a certain place, and you need to go down to him and uh, tells him his name and what, what was Ananias's response to Jesus? You remember that? Did Ananias say, oh yeah, no problem. No, his reaction was, uh, uh, you know, if I could paraphrase in this time and in, in this age, uh, Lord, have you, have you been reading the, watching CNN lately? <laughs> this guy's, He's persecuting us everywhere in all these cities. And Jesus has to tell him, never mind, <laughs> go your way. He's, a, he's my chosen vessel. So, all right. And one thing I like about when, uh, notice Paul gives this detail in verse 13. And he said to me, brother Saul, right off the bat, He's a brother. That's pretty amazing, I think. And, and obviously, for Paul to relate that, I think that probably stuck with him his whole life. That he, you know, because later in another place, he says, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle, you know, because I persecuted the saints. And so his whole life is just filled with such gratitude. And later on, we will find out and acts that, you know, this whole scenario is just like, they're so determined to kill him that he's, he's I, I, I think at one point he actually gets discouraged. Well, maybe I made the wrong decision to come here to Jerusalem because this is, this is really, this is really bad here. Maybe I should have listened to what, you know, the prophets and prophetesses were telling me that I, you know, what was gonna happen. Or I have a reference here. I'll read this reference in verse on verse 16. It says, uh, now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It says, he then spoke of his former zeal in persecuting the disciples of Christ, even unto death. And he narrated the circumstances of his conversion, telling his hearers how his own proud heart had been led to bow to the crucified Nazarene. Had he attempted to enter into argument with his opponents, they would have stubbornly refused to listen to his words. But the relation of his experience was attended with a convincing power that for the time seemed so soft to soften and subdue their hearts. He then endeavored to show that his work among the Gentiles had not been entered upon with, from choice. He had desired to labor for his own nation. But in that very temple, the voice of God had spoken to him in holy vision, directing his course 
far hence unto the Gentiles. So, so that when he, as soon as he mentioned uh, that God told them, depart for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. You know, they were listening. They were, everything was fine. Everything was going smoothly. As soon as he says it, <laughs> Jesus told them, depart to the Gentiles. What was their reaction? Yeah, verse 22 says, and they listened to him until this word. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. So what's this uh, tearing their clothes off and throwing dust in the air? What's that all about? I think some translation, I'm not sure I read one commentary. They are taking off their cloaks. In other words, it's almost like saying, hey, you know, rolling up your sleeves and prepared to do the dirty work, so to speak. And then this throwing dust in the air. The, I was looking up the keyword search. It's one thing about having a, you know, like this here, this, I have this on the right side, you'll see on my screen, this treasury of scripture knowledge. They'll link passages where different words are, where they think that that passage might be linked to somewhere else in the Bible. The only place I found with this dust reference was uh, here in 2 Samuel 16, 13. And this is the case where David, you know, he's, he's, he's fleeing and says, and David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hills side over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. So that kind of gives you an idea that the symbolism of casting dust into the air is, you know, they're just, you know, they're just so, uh, he's such an offense to them. Is that yeah, similar to when Jesus told the disciples to shake off the dust off their feet when they left? I mean, is that comparable or, or not? Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. I didn't think of that one. Um, and I've never really thought about the symbolism in that. Um, it could be if, if this dust, as Shim and I was throwing dust, and here we have them throwing dust, it's like, okay, Denise says they're making a statement that they believe that he's cursed of God. Now, it's interesting that feet are a symbol of what? What are feet a symbol of in scripture? They're a symbol of those who carry the gospel. How beautiful are the feet on the mountains of them that bring glad tidings of peace or joy. I can't remember exactly how the, I think it's somewhere in Isaiah. So if you're uh, dusting the dust off your feet and dust is a symbol of offense yeah, people may there's a lot of people who do take i mean the face it the gospel is offensive because to accept the gospel you're basically saying that yeah i can't save myself i you know it's it's humbling for our human nature to admit that there's nothing good in us it's a, it's a you know our flesh is offended by that and if you want to you want to try that out go to go walk up to a stranger and say uh, you may not know, know me, but I would like you to know that there's nothing good in you and see how they react. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what the gospel tells us. You know, when Paul in the book of Romans, before he enters, introduce, he briefly introduces the good news of the gospel, but then immediately he turns to the sin problem in chapter two and three, and he goes and he shows just how bad our situation is in terms of our human nature and he says there's there's not one not not there's no one good not even one and he, he talks about how all together we've gone astray you know on our tongues is uh, you know the the poison of asp 
I mean, it's, you know, and, and his conclusion is that so that all the world may become guilty before God. You know, so our situation is, it's kind of like, you know, in one sense, you really, to prepare someone to hear the gospel, they have to come to the point where they have to recognize their need. You don't go up to somebody who's just come out of a restaurant and, and, and hand them a plate full of food. You know, they're not going to want it. But if you, but if that person hasn't eaten all day and you hand them a plate full of food, their response is going to be a whole lot different. All, any, anything in Acts that we've covered so far. Let's see if I have any other. Oh, there's another note that I missed. It says in verse 7, there's another little detail that uh, was related. It says, uh, it says here, Paul says, I fell to the ground. But in Acts 26, he says, and everyone with me fell down too. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. companions. When we all, when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard to kick against the pricks or the goads. So here we get a glimpse that it wasn't just Paul fell to the ground. Everybody fell to the ground. But of course, they didn't hear what was being said uh, because Jesus had only opened up a one-way channel between himself and Paul. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much that you are such a wonderful savior because we are such great sinners. And so Father, we take great comfort in reading these accounts of history and knowing that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And you promised, he who comes to me, I will no wise cast out. And Father, all we have to do is we just keep coming to you because we know that of ourselves, we can do nothing. You've chosen us, you've redeemed us, you've called us your own. We are yours. And so Father, we thank you and praise you in the wonderful name of your son. Amen. 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 Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, G. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Glad bye. you guys could join us.